Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never practice nunchucks in a crowded room. Never eat chole before a road trip. Always take your shirt off before you iron it. Don't take a call near a swimming pool. And don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully. We've been sitting on a particularly significant issue for several days now. And this is the decline of Chinese economy or the fading of China. If you've been following international media, particularly international financial and economic media, you would have seen lots of writings on this. An impression has been building up. I know a lot of people say, oh, this must be just Western propaganda. But remember, the Western economy is a really deeply embedded in the Chinese economy. And there is a great deal of symbiotic relationship there. So it's not as if the Western world, the Western capitalist world looks forward to, to the decline of the Chinese economy. In fact, they might benefit from it. Look at what's happening in China. What's happening in China is the Chinese economy surely has slowed down. The Chinese economy had consistently grown at above 5.5% between say 2010 and 2019. That is the pre-pandemic year. Since then, it's been struggling. If you see the last three years, in 2022, the Chinese economy grew by 3%. 2023, it grew by 5.2%, although there are lots of doubts and skepticism about how genuine that growth rate is. And I, as we go along, I will tell you in a little bit of detail to the extent that I can simplify it, why this, where this skepticism comes from. And now it looks like the Chinese growth is not going to be more than 4%. The Chinese government likes to set up targets, so they say 5%, and when they say 5%, what happens then is that all the local governments get their targets in the provinces and places, and they, in trying to meet these targets, they try to drive up economic activity. In trying to drive up economic activity, very often they borrow money. Those borrowings then pile up, and the result of that is debt, 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 debt. I've said it six times because China is under a mountain of debt. China, China's debt to GDP ratio at this point is 300%. And if the Chinese have to again drive up their economic growth and keep it at 4 to 5%, which is a lot of growth for an economy, which is already more than $18 trillion worth. So 4 5% consistently will be a lot of growth. But if they keep driving that by borrowing, investing, borrowing, investing, then their debt to GDP ratio in the next 10 years would go up to 400 to 450 to 500 percent. That will be unsustainable for China. That's the crisis the Chinese are in. The other big fact about China, and I will share with you a bunch of articles. In fact, with the description of this, of this episode, you will see a bunch of articles listed. You can go to them. Many of them are from Carnegie Endowment, some from the Wall Street Journal, some from other publications and two from Financial Times written by Ruchir Sharma. So in fact, in one of those Ruchir Sharma articles, we get the nugget. In fact, one from each of those articles. One is that the Chinese can, at this point, in the near future, in the foreseeable future, can give up the idea of becoming an economy bigger than America's as a fantasy. Until a few years back, everybody seemed to believe that the Chinese will outstrip America in the size of their economy. And this will happen not just in our lives, but probably in our youth and in our middle age, whatever stage of life we were in, that's unlikely to happen. Because as Ruchir points out, in his 10 trends for 2024, his, his, his annual article, that the Chinese economy, Chinese GDP, had gone up to 76% of American GDP in 2021, 76%. And at that growth rate, because there was a growth differential between China and America, America wasn't growing that fast, the Chinese might have had an opportunity of overtaking America, but two things happened. One, the American economic growth picked up. That is something that people don't give Joe Biden the credit for, even in America, but the American economic growth picked up. 
and at the same time Chinese economic growth declined. So 2021, China was 76% of America's GDP. Today they are 65% of America's GDP and given the growth rates now and given the base at which the American economy starts compared to the Chinese economy, this gap, gap is not likely to narrow. This gap is likely to increase and for the Chinese to now compete, they will have to repeat the same thing that they've been doing in the past. And what they've been doing in the past is borrowing, 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 encouraging borrowing and investing. What happens is, and again, these are areas of complex economics that I don't know very much about, but I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to understand from smart people who are helping me and then getting that wisdom, I'm trying to further simplify it for you. Now, if you look at investment, for every dollar of investment, these are global norms, for every dollar of investment, you need three dollars of consumption, right? Because if you are investing, you are producing. You are not producing, you are not investing one dollar to produce one dollar worth of goods. So for to justify every dollar of investment, you should have three dollars of con uh, consumption. That is the global norm with modern economies also. That's how modern economies work. In China, that consumption, consumption level is very low. It's only $1.3. So for every dollar invested, their own consumption is only $1.3. What that means is that the rest of the production that they have through this investment, they must sell all over the world. And if that doesn't happen, they are not able to do it, then they are in trouble. And that's what's been happening because Lately, the American economy has picked up many other economies, Poland, Mexico, and most of all, India. They've all picked up and they are investing in their own, own economies. Investment levels are going up everywhere. At the same time, because the Chinese economy is not growing, foreign investors are moving out of China. One, the economy is not growing. Second, there is a great deal of suspicion about how Xi Jinping is running his government. Third, Xi Jinping's actions on the political economy have become very unpredictable. See how he went, he went after, after his top entrepreneurs, top globally famous entrepreneurs like Jack Ma or how he demolished his ed tech sector. That is not something that foreign investors like. In fact, in 2023, for the first time since the Chinese boom started, China's net FDI flows have become negative. That's a very important point. Now, now I told you, and this is a 21st century principle, for every dollar of investment you need $3 of consumption. China has only 1.3. So that creates a gap. Now you can, look, you can look at it in a different way. The different way of looking at this is that China until 2021 accounted for 18% of global GDP. In fact, they had reached that number earlier than that. That's almost one-fifth of global GDP. At the same time, they had only 13% of global consumption. So the remaining 5% accounted for, I mean, it was filled in with exports, but also that is the investment that came from Chinese borrowing. So 13% of global consumption, 18% of global GDP, but more importantly, 32% of global investment. So Chinese had an overhang of debt and an overhang of investment as well. Again, if you look at investments, generally in modern economies, investment accounts for, for about 25% of GDP. In India's case, for example, my colleague uh, TCA Sharad Raghavan, our editor for economics, he tells me that India's ratio is about 29%. Generally, modern economies have in the ballpark of 25%. In China's case, it's always been, it, it, it's always been upwards of 40% in the last 20 years. In last 20 years, it has not fallen below 40%. At this point, it's about 42 to 44%. That's where it's floating in the last couple of years. And in 2010-11, it reached, it hit the peak of 47%. So that's an economy much more dependent on investments. And in that economy, if investments come down, one, because FDI is now net negative, it's going out, people don't have the confidence of continuing to invest in China, and they have options available. They have options available, they have Vietnam next door to China, they have Indonesia, they have India, of course, 
Then they have Poland, they have Mexico. Mexico, in fact, has been the biggest beneficiary of FDI moving out of China. So the Chinese are caught in this situation. Too much investment, too much debt, too little, too little economic growth. And that is a, that is a trap that's very difficult to get out of. How do we list the problems the Chinese have? I told you next time, multi debt multiplied by six, or maybe debt raised to the power six, because debt is such a terrible scourge. Because debt is bad for an individual, a company, anybody. Too much debt can be a killer. So in China's case, most of its problems today come out of debt. Debt has come in because there's been pressure to drive up growth, whether there is demand or not, because, because also the Chinese Communist Party wants to show that they are growing fast and there's been, there's been this political objective also of making their economy bigger than America's. That's been the competition for the moment that competition is lost. And there is nothing on the ground to suggest that the Chinese are going to catch up with America for a very long time. In fact, America at this point is pulling away whatever you might say about the American system. So the Chinese, Chinese problems, I'm just listing them for you. One, debts in property have gone wrong. There are too much debts in property which have gone wrong. Of the 100 biggest real estate companies in China. And China is humongous real estate companies in China. I don't think India has any real estate company which will feature in China's top 100 companies because these are so big. India's real estate companies tend to be confined to some cities or the odd city or the same one city or maybe a couple of cities. But India's real estate companies are not multi-city, multi-state. They are not spread across the country or across the coastline or across a bunch of business cities or new or new developments. They are, they are smaller, local. In China's case, they are big. So of the 100 biggest companies there, 50 have already defaulted. 50 have defaulted on their offshore debt. Of these 50 of the largest 100 property, uh, property companies who've defaulted, the top five, the biggest five together have defaulted $266 billion in their offshore debt. $266 billion is not small change. And this is just five of China's biggest builders. I told you 50 of the 100 biggest have defaulted, so remaining 45 will also account for quite a bit, but I'm only giving you the figure for the top five. That went belly up. That went belly up. There were many efforts to try and revive it. Its owner, some of the top people were arrested for misdemeanors. Government also tried doing something. They got the regulator to take over Evergrande's insurance company, for example. Finally, nothing worked. And a Hong Kong court on 29th of January, that's just a couple of weeks back, announced or ordered the closure, liquidation of Evergrande. So that is what's happened to China's property sector. So one, the biggest problem is debt in property. Now, because there is debt in property, there is also debt in local governments. How does that work? I told you just a while back that the Chinese Communist Party says, oh, we need 5% growth. So every local government also has to make its contribution to that growth. It's like having growth targets or quotas. Growth targets everybody gets. Marketing and sales people also get growth, growth targets. In some organizations, journalists also might get growth targets. How many people will read your story or how many people will watch your video, etc. So growth targets are not unhealthy. But when you are the government, you are giving, you are the big government, Party, party owned government, you give targets to your local governments who are also party owned governments, then everybody has to please the boss. How do these local governments get that growth? Now, these local governments then borrow money because they have to drive up growth. When they make these borrowings, how do they hope to repay these loans? They hope to repay these loans by selling land because the party owns the land, the state owns the land, so they can auction that land and repay their debt. How much value they can get by auctioning that land would then depend on how good is the genuine good quality economic growth. That's one problem. And second, how good are the real estate prices? Because if the real estate prices remain high, then these local governments will get more value for selling this land. If the real estate prices collapse, then they get very little value. So what happens in the process is that everybody defaults on their debt. First of all, the builders. Builders have already pre-sold these houses. At this point, estimates tell us, and these are estimates by reputed China watcher economists, 
estimates are that that there are at this point more than 20 million units that is more than 2 crore houses 2 crore flats more than 2 crore units of uncompleted and delayed pre-sold houses which means people have paid for these these houses they paid they paid their collateral and they've also borrowed their money now the buyers who have borrowed from banks or institutions many of them have stopped servicing their own loans paying their emis because they don't see these houses getting ready for that for them to take over builders on the other hand pre-sold these houses borrowed money all of this you see in noida greater noida area that is the area that say supreme court and and government of india are now trying to intercede into to help home buyers get their houses for which they paid but these are just but the scale of this problem say around delhi maybe a few thousand apartments in the rest of the country also maybe another 10000 20000 30000 50000 100000 maybe maybe half a million apartments i am exaggerating it can't be half a million in india in china it's 20 million such apartments so the buyer for of the apartments stop repaying their debt to the banks, the buyer of the apartment also stops paying further installments to the builder. The builder who's already collected the upfront money collateral from the buyer has invested this money or maybe in some cases has stolen this money. They need more money now to complete these projects. To complete these projects, where will the money come from? Money will come from borrowing from the same banks and institutions the same banks and institutions are now no longer trust the trust the builder or developer because his buyers are not paying so the banks refuse to pay the builder and that's how the builder goes belly up and because the builder goes belly up builder cannot repay the banks the debt they had taken from the banks banks shadow banks financial institutions so, so they also go belly up so the, so, so when in india we had this problem of the banks having bad debts and also borrowers going bankrupt and not and, and not being able to service their debt. Arvind, Arvind Subramanian, our, our then chief economic advisor, had called India's double balance sheet problem. What you're seeing in China right now, and I'm oversimplifying it, is China's triple balance sheet problem. And that is the biggest weight on China's economy right now. Then you, have, then you have other problems. I told you about debts in property, uh, in the entire property business, from the builder to the buyer to the banker. Number two, debt in local, local governments, that also I told you. Number three, low household confidence. Now, families don't have the confidence to borrow more and buy. It's also linked to China's demographics, which I will come to, because China is producing too few babies. So China is now bringing in too few young people into their workforce and families don't have growing children. These are, these are families of the second generation of single child families in China and they are, they are not so optimistic about the future that they will borrow. But it's only when people are optimistic that they will borrow and invest, not otherwise. Otherwise they are, they are collecting for their pensions. Next, there are geopolitical tensions. That is something that purely Xi Jinping has invited upon himself because I think he gets his thrills doing that. So he's picked up pangas with, with the US over Taiwan, with all his neighbors, uh, Japan, the Philippines, everybody, most importantly, with India as well. He's opened up all his fronts. So there are geopolitical tensions everywhere. Then, of course, declining birth rate. It's declining much faster than anybody had imagined. And then China's total factor productivity. Now, let me not explain this to you. You can Google it, but just see it as productivity. That is declining rapidly. So between 1980s and 90s, in 1980s and 90s, China's boom years, it ranged between, say, 3.1 to 3.5, supposedly very healthy. By 1998, it had come to 2.8, still quite robust. Now, between 2009 and 2018, it's been declining rapidly and it's come to 0.7%. So declining, so household debt, bank debt, builder debt, builders going bankrupt, mostly, mostly construction driven, local consumption and local growth, debt in local governments, debt at the national level, low household confidence, geopolitical tensions, declining birth rate, and heavily declining productivity. This is how you define a perfect storm in the world's 
deputy superpowers economy. Now, how did some of this problem start in the Chinese Chinese construction center, Chinese building se sector? The fact that it was over leveraged, that everybody was borrowing too much, that had become known to the Chinese government at the central level. It's a very centralized government. That had come to become known to them by 2016, 17, 18, when they had seen many years of growth. By that time, they decided to answer it. And how does, how does an authoritarian government try to answer a problem once they've identified a problem? They go at it with a sledgehammer. So in 2020 August, the Chinese Communist Party came up with their own idea of disciplining this market or, or of controlling this excess of borrowing and overspending by coming up with the policy of what was called as three red lines. So what was these three red lines is important to watch. These three red lines were number one, that, that for anybody, any builder, their liabilities have to be less than 70% of their assets. So if somebody has an inventory of, say, $100 billion, their liabilities cannot be more than $70 billion. That's their borrowings of money that they owe to others. Number two, the second red line, debt to equity ratio has to be below 100%. So you cannot borrow more than your equity, right? Very tight. Number three, Cash to short-term debt should be at least a 100%. So whatever a short-term debt is, they define short-term debt in different ways at different stages. At any point of time, the cash in your bank should be more than your short-term debt, which means if you're all, all your short-term lenders want their money back, you should be able to write out the checks right away. Now, most companies found it difficult. By this time, companies had got over leveraged already. Most companies found it difficult to meet this criteria because with this criteria, they were punitive follow-up actions. If you did not meet one of the three, the first of the three, if you met all three criteria, you could borrow 15% more. You could borrow 15% more of your current borrowings, right? You could go up. I've met all my, all my criteria. I can borrow I'm already a uh, $500 billion uh, company. I can borrow another $75 billion. If you don't meet one of the three conditions, then this 15% became 10%. If you could not meet two of the three conditions, you could only borrow 5% more. And if you did not meet any of the three conditions, then you could borrow nothing. So that what was that? That was the script being written for China's triple balance sheet problem. Now, what is happening as a result? So I take you back now to one of Ruchir's articles, Ruchir Sharma's articles, who says that China's rise is now reversing. I'll share this article with you. You also see a screenshot on, on your screens. China's rise is reversing. And he said the last two years have seen the largest drop in China's share of the global GDP. I told you that by 2020-21, China was 18% of the global GDP. That's almost one in five or almost one fifth. Now it has come down and it has come down quite substantially. And this is the highest fall in China's share of the global GDP since the Mao era. How does it work? I will tell you through Ruchir in this case. He says that before 1990, China's, China's share in the global economy, global GDP was below 2%, below 2%. India's at this point is close to 4%. Uh, China's before 1990 was below 2%. It rose by 2021 to 18.4%. I told you almost, almost one in five, almost one fifth. No other country had risen so much so fast. In 2022, it slowed down a bit. So the share declined. 2023, a bit more. It has now come to 17%. So within two years, what was 18.4% of global GDP has become 17% of global GDP. This is the heaviest fall in China's share of the global GDP from, from, from the Mao era. Now, this has, this, has many, this has many reasons. One is the Chinese economy has slowed down. But the second is also that other major countries' economy, economic growth has gone up. First of all, most importantly, America's economic growth has gone up. But also other countries, Mexico, Poland, etc., etc. And very importantly, India's economic growth also on a larger base has been quite robust. And that's how the Chinese share in the global GDP is declining. So where is this? Where is this growth going? Global economy has grown 
post the pandemic. So if you see the global economy between 2022 and 23, it grew by $8 trillion. That's from Richard's article in FT. $8 trillion, that is to $8 trillion, it went up to $105 trillion. So I told you India is about 4%, so India is closer to close to $4 trillion or thereabouts. So that's how I calculated and I said generally 4%, but I used the rounding error in a manner to suit ourselves. That said, $105 trillion, the global economy became in 2023, growing by $8 trillion over the previous year. Of this, 45% went to America. Once again, never, never underestimate America. 45% of this growth went to America. This also include India. China's real potential growth rate, if I read everything on international media, even from enthusiasts of China, or if I, if I watch what, what Martin Wolf tells Farid Zakaria on, on, on his show GPS, in fact, I will share a link, link of that tweet with you, which has this little clip of Martin Wolf talking. If you see all of that, nobody imagines that the Chinese economy can now grow at more than 2.5%. Ruchir also tells us that in nominal dollar terms, Chinese economy will decline. It has declined in 2023 for the first time since the devaluation of the Chinese currency renminbi in 1994 and today because china is a unique country at a time when all the rest of the world is battling inflation china has actually had deflation that's because of the command economy of the kind that they have followed because chinese have had deflation and they've also had property bust in this situation to expect growth is very tough and when Net FDI has become negative to expect growth is very, very, very tough. And he says, Ruchir says, and I quote from him, almost no matter what she does, his nation's share in the global economy is likely to decline in the foreseeable future. It is a post-China world now. Now, in conclusion, I will take you back to an editorial that Kaikshin is almost a free world Chinese website, very respected and very pro-market, very pro-market, very reformist. So in an editorial that got published on December 25 last year, that is, that, that is just over, uh, over six weeks back, a day before Mao Zedong's 130th birth anniversary. In that editorial, Kai Shen pointed out to all the problems, the trouble and the crisis in Chinese economy. And they said, and it's a very cheeky line, and you are smart enough, you'll figure out why, why I call it cheeky. That line said, one can only correct inappropriate policies in a timely manner if one sticks to seeking truth from facts. Within hours, that editorial disappeared. Nobody's explained what happened to that editorial, why it, why it disappeared, nor has it been found elsewhere. Now, why did I say this is a mischievous line? Because seeking truth from facts is, 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 is an idiom of Chinese wisdom that Mao Zedong made famous in 1936 he used for the first time and made it famous all the time for all the all times to come and it, and it became an internationally global Marxist dictum. So Kaishin used that idiom effectively to mock the current Chinese government and no wonder that editorial was taken off within hours. But that in fact tells us also the problem in China, the problem with the Chinese economy. Problem that's come from arrogance, over borrowing, over investing, not consuming enough, not producing enough babies and also most importantly from having an authoritarian style of working where everything is done in a centralized manner and that system does not respect the markets. It may have benefited from the markets but it does not let market forces play out and that's the reason you find so many investors also giving up on China at this point of time.